I think we have a poor set of global leaders for conservatism at the moment, but conservatism will survive and will flourish in the future, even if we have to go, if we have to go through some tough times before we realise yet again we need conservative principles. Hello and welcome to Offscript. My name is Stephen Edgington. Today I'm joined by Tim Montgomery, a man who has been described as one of the most influential conservative commentators in Britain. He also founded the Conservative Home website and was briefly an advisor to Boris Johnson. Who better to talk to then about the state of modern conservatism and what conservatives should do if they feel angry and depressed? Is conservatism dead? Well, you're getting straight to the questions, uh, Stephen. Um, I think conservatism is going through a really rough patch and I think there are all sorts of reasons for it. But conservatism isn't dead. And I think, you know, Mrs Thatcher famously said the facts of life are conservative. And for me, that is the reality. I think you borrow too much, you get into trouble. You neglect the family. You neglect national defence. You neglect the basic things that conservatives always stood for. And sooner or later, you get yourself into trouble. And I think we have a poor set of global leaders for conservatism at the moment. Um, but conservatism will survive and will flourish in the future, even if we have to go um, if we have to go through some tough times before we realise yet again we need conservative principles. And there's two things there, isn't there? Especially in Britain, you've got conservatism as an ideology and you've got the Conservative Party. Now, you are a member, I think, of the Conservative Party and you believe in the Conservative Party. Why should we trust them to get this right? I don't think we should trust them to get it right. Um, Stephen, you and I are journalists. Um, there are people out there, grassroots members, uh, there are campaign organisations. The reason why it's as important to have a conservative movement, if you like, for want of a better expression, as it is to have a conservative party, is that we need to keep our politicians honest, if you like. And one of the great realities of British politics for the last however many years, you were a little bit involved in this keeping the conservative party honest, which was the rise of UKIP, the rise of the Brexit party. We had to the right, for want of a better expression, of David Cameron, Theresa May, Boris Johnson. We had this political movement that scared the living daylights out of conservative, certain conservative MPs. And so they weren't able to do what Boris Johnson is able to do at the moment. Boris Johnson is able to cuddle up to the soggy centre without any real electoral implications. Keir Starmer, if you, in contrast, has the Greens, the SNP, the Liberal Democrats all nipping at his feet. He knows that if he goes in a direction that sort of left wing people don't approve of, the left wing people, left wing voters have plenty of alternatives. Conservative voters, of course, can stay at home um, if they're really unhappy uh, with Boris Johnson, but they don't have that Nigel Farage led alternative that for a long time, largely powered by Europe, as we know, but for a long time, uh, did keep the Conservative Party closer to conservatism than it otherwise would have been. Before we get ahead of ourselves, can you just give your idea of what the modern Conservative Party is under Boris Johnson? Well, let me say two polite and positive things before I stick the knife in. <laughs> um, Boris Johnson, without Boris Johnson, I'm not sure that the country would have voted for Brexit. Uh, the restoration for me of national sovereignty is one of the great achievements of modern conservatism. It was done in partnership with others, but certainly it wouldn't have happened without the modern Conservative Party and people like Boris Johnson. Um, he defeated Jeremy Corbyn, something Theresa May couldn't do. And so those are two pretty significant achievements. And, you know, I, I have a lot of affection for Boris Johnson on a personal level. But the modern Conservative Party is certainly not a party of low taxation. It's certainly not a party of small government. Not even sure you could really say it's a party of law and order. What it is, is two things, unfortunately. It's a party of the old. Its uh, whole policies are skewed towards helping older voters. And it's a party of about staying in power. And I'm afraid Boris Johnson personifies that. He'd like to stay in government for a very long time and how he stays in government, what purpose he serves while he's in government, I think is very much secondary to him. 
Let's go back to the beginning of your journey within the conservative movement. Why did you originally become a conservative? I'm a little bit older than you, Stephen, just, just a few years. Just a couple um, of years, yeah. I, <laughs> I became a conservative when I was 11, essentially. This is sort of embarrassing William Hay type moment. Um, but um, that was 1981, which for those with uh, sharper minds will know exactly how old I am today. But it was 1981. Uh, my teacher at school uh, told me how evil nuclear weapons were. And I went home to my dad, who was an army officer, and um, I told him that I was very ashamed to be his son and that he was supporting these evil things, nuclear weapons. And um, he introduced me to the theory of nuclear deterrence. I went back to my school the next day, had a hand up, told my teacher that things are a little bit more complicated than she shared. And there was this lady on the television with big hair and a handbag. And I fell in love with her, really. She was, um, she was the reason I became conservative. And I sort of, you know, and I think that is where, that is where I think all conservatives really should start. National defence. If we can't keep the country safe, if we can't keep people safe, we're failing in our most fundamental duty as a state. And that's why I've been, I've been moved and upset really, but at a, at a deep level, by what's happened in Afghanistan recently. The West has been thoroughly defeated. Um, it's run away from a fight that it didn't finish. Uh, properly. And the British House of Commons, it had some stirring moments. Tom Tugendhat's speech um, in the House of Commons made him, I think, almost a global rock star of conservatism. Um, but very few other people, certainly not the Prime Minister, have really responded to this moment uh, properly. Uh, the debate in the House of Commons in the last few days, Stephen, just seemed like it was like a tidying up exercise. Boris, you could almost, if you were a Martian coming from outer space, you could almost think nothing much had happened. And uh, Boris Johnson was concluding and uh, talking about a victory. We were humiliated in Afghanistan, and that has emboldened all of our enemies. And we should be an awful lot more worried about it than I think we are. Before we get on to 2021, I want to stick in the 80s. Um, and it seems to me that an important part of your conservative beliefs obviously is national security and sort of internationalism. At the time, uh, you know, we had the Cold War was raging and, and Margaret Thatcher and, and Ronald Reagan were obviously major parts of that. So can you also talk about your values, though, as you're growing up as a young conservative, that sort of cringe phrase these days? But what, what were your values? I mean, did you have a strong sort of traditional family household? What were your aspirations and how did this link in with your ideology? I was very fortunate. I think um, my family weren't a wealthy family. My dad was became an officer in the army, but he left school without any qualifications. Um, he he worked his way up through the ranks. Uh, my mum was a um, supermarket assistant, did the checkout, etc. Um, but that's not to devalue what they were. I think I was. I think I've, I've been born won the lottery in life by being born British. I'm really proud of our country. But I had a mum and dad who would and still would do anything for me. Um, you know, and I think that is the best thing that any child can have in life. Two people in their corner all through their life. And I think that is the, you know, you cannot build a good civilization if children aren't brought up properly. And so for me, the family is absolutely crucial. And, you know, you, I think my certainly experience, you know, if you talk to single parents, um, who do an amazing job, the vast majority of the children, but they will tell you it's hard work. They don't want for their own children, for them to be on their own in the, in the bringing up of children. And I think we need to just be a little bit more honest as, you know, politicians are afraid about talking about the family because some of them have divorced, some of their families haven't worked out. But, you know, who, who in Britain today is part of an extended family network where there hasn't been some divorce or, you know, disruption? What we need today is just like businesses fail. That doesn't mean that we never talk about setting up another business. Let's try and make the aspiration to build families a really important part of conservatism because the state is growing ever bigger. Taxes are rising. And one of the fundamental reasons is because the family is so weak. 
the best way of fighting crime, the best way of educating our young people, the best way of looking after old people is to have strong families. And at the moment, our families are just getting weaker and weaker. And the Conservative Party doesn't even talk about the issue, let alone begin to come up with policies to turn that situation around. It's funny because as a sort of child of the 21st century, any idea, and, I, and as you're I've been... Rubbing, you're rubbing on your youth now, aren't you? <laughs> I may be, slightly. Um, but uh, as a child of, that, you know, of this modern era, and as someone who's been exposed to sort of conservative ideas uh, as I was growing up, uh, you know, online and watching stuff and reading stuff, and this, this talk of families to me, and this is just my own kind of experience, but this talk of um, family values was always kind of um, se seemed to me like this kind of American evangelical idea and a bit, bit sort of, I mean, this is just as I was growing up, you know, I had a sort of socialist mother and everything, so I was kind of exposed to that. But it seemed to me as this kind of slightly, um, I don't know, sort of old fashioned and a bit, um, a bit extreme and a bit um, sort of George W. Bush style, you know, uh, American conservatism. Uh, and it was always seen yeah. as a, a sort of negative, perhaps slightly um, deranged thing. I don't know. But what do you think? Why do you think uh, conversations around the family unit have, have become so, uh, so sparse in British politics? I, th I think there are all sorts of reasons. Um, I think a l uh, what you said is absolutely right. And I think family values, for example, you know, we live in this world at the moment. I think it's one of the most fascinating aspects of political and cultural conversation is what happens in America, well, like whether it's the Black Lives Matter movement, we're about to have a Supreme Court uh, decision on Roe versus Wade, which will probably overturn the abortion laws in the United States. If that episode is anything like the Black Lives Matter movement, that debate of what American courts decide will be as if it's happened in Britain. You know, we had those uh, British protesters outside Downing Street shouting at unarmed British police officers saying, don't shoot. You know, they, there's this importation of American culture and application of American politics to us that I think we need to think a little bit more seriously about how we counter that, particularly if you're interested in, uh, in conservative politics. Um, and of course, a huge part of the debate in America over family values, back to your point, was there was a lot of opposition to homosexuality. And I think family values got caught up uh, in a very, very traditionalist perspective. And uh, one of the reasons I backed uh, same-sex marriage when David Cameron put it forward was lots of my, and I respect them for it, lots of my fellow sort of Christians in the Conservative Party felt that was a betrayal of marriage. I actually thought it was a way of making marriage culturally central and acceptable um, to young people again. And so I understand where you're coming from. I understand why family values has those connotations. Um, but uh, the aspiration to marriage, I uh, don't know what your aspiration is, Stephen, but most opinion polls find that most young people, they want to get married. Their, their ideal is still that. It's an eternal belief across uh, civilization. And so maybe it's not trendy to talk about, but it's essential and constant, I think, in our in our makeup as human beings. We're not meant to be alone. We're meant to be another with another person and marriage and families at the heart of that. And you mentioned there another topic that's rarely talked about, and that's religion, especially in, in British politics. Mm -hmm. How much did religion influence you when you were younger? And how does this tie in with, first of all, your exposure to, again, conservative politics as you were growing up and your aspirations and your personal beliefs? Because I think that's really interesting. And also, um, can we tie the, the decline of religion to the decline of conservative or at least socially conservative ideals? Wow. These are big questions, and they're, they're, I'm rarely asked about this, but funny enough, I was asked about it. I did a program with Nigel Farage on GB News earlier this week, and we talked about it. And um, I think it's fundamentally related to what we've just been talking about. I think a lot of recent Christian involvement in politics, particularly because of the way we import our discourse from the United States, has been associated with abortion and homosexuality. If you think about Christian involvement in politics, it's those two things. And, you know, I'm, I, I would regard myself as pro-life. I'm not going to, you know, flee away from, from that issue. But if you look at the overall history of Christian involvement in politics, 
William Wilberforce is my great political hero. He fought the campaign, first against the slave trade, then against slavery overall. Shaftesbury reformed the factories, the appalling Victorian factory conditions. More recently, Reverend Martin Luther King you know, fought for racial equality in America. In the last 20 years, it's been Christians that have been leading on uh, investing more in the overseas, uh, fighting poverty in developing worlds, vaccines, malaria nets. And so overall, no, no group of people have a perfect influence on politics, but I think the net contribution of Christians to politics is a good one. And for me, both of the Labour, the modern Labour and Conservative philosophies have one big thing in common. They are materialist philosophies. They essentially, the right sees us as taxpayers, uh, patriots, uh, citizens in that sense, economic functioning uh, units. The left sees people as trade union members or welfare claimants or public sector workers. Whereas the Bible, whereas Christianity, whereas most of the world's religion, they see us as parents, as neighbours, as volunteers, as they see social, the social side of who we are. They see us as relational people. And I think that's the weakest part of our society at the moment. We have a weak network of relationships. And if the relationships in society are weak, the state steps in. And when the state steps in, look at children in care. When, children, when families fail and the state starts looking after children, it's incredibly expensive. And it's also invariably not very effective. Some children in care flourish, but very few do. When the state substitutes for the natural organisations of society, it's just not very good at it. And so you can believe in all of these things that I've just discussed without being a Christian, without being a Muslim. Of course you can. Um, but I would say that the decline to your question, has the decline of Christian involvement in the Conservative Party affected it? Absolutely. And Labour used to be known, you know, there was, there was the Methodist versus the Marxist tradition on the left. Well, the Methodist tradition is in very bad shape. Um, and so, yes, I think there has been a big consequence of the decline of the Christian contribution in public, in public life. And I, I also later on in this interview want to get on to the kind of modern debate around not just conservatism, but generally about what our purpose is in life. And I think what's so fascinating in recent years with this sort of culture war debate, you've seen the rise of people like Jordan Peterson who have really engaged millions of people, particularly young people around the world, questioning their own life and questioning what is the, why am I here? What is the point in me living? And there's, you know, you know, we can talk about the huge rise of anxiety, depression, suicide rates, things like that later on. But I think, you know, this is such a fascinating time to have this debate. But before we do that, I want to ask a really fundamental, basic question, and you've sort of answered this already. Uh, but what is conservatism? Because people today growing up might think it's uh, loving the NHS or uh, getting Brexit done or whatever the most recent conservative slogan is in, in their election campaigns. But I suspect you disagree with that uh, analysis. Conservatism for me isn't just about the market. It isn't just about the state. It isn't just about society. It's about all of those things performing their proper role in some sort of union. We, we, we need effective markets. We need wealth creators. Um, but that doesn't mean the market should be dominant because actually from the moral cultural sphere, as the Catholic theologian Michael Novak described it, we need the parents, we need the volunteers, we need the, we need the church groups, we need the, the, the private charities. And then from the state sector, um, we do need a basic welfare state we do need an army we do need a police force and the, the, the challenge of conservatism isn't to say that any one of those things the market the state or society is the most important thing it's about ensuring that each of those aren't don't step on the other don't exclude or crowd out the other but they are all strong um because if i if any one of those parts a week i think a country stops working and Unfortunately, at the moment, we largely have a Labour Party that's only really interested in the state side. We have a Conservative Party that is only really interested in the state and the market. And we don't have anyone really standing up for that social side. Um, there's lots of ways of describing conservatism. Um, but for, for me, 
that would be probably where I would start. Does that make sense, Stephen? It does, and I think that was a good explanation. I think um, it's such a, you know it's a, such a difficult thing to de to de to um, to uh, define. Uh, but one thing you didn't mention that I think I thought you might mention is this idea, the literal definition of the word, and that is to conserve things. And you know, if you speak to various conservative thinkers, they would like Roger Scruton or Peter Hitchens or whoever, they would say, well, look, the point of conservative conservatism is to basically uh, keep things that are good and make sure that they are cherished within society. So, what do you what do you make of that uh, part of conservatism? I think I'd like to hire you as my spin doctor and advisor, please. Or maybe we should spin the uh, interview around and I should be interviewing you. No, yeah, absolutely. The, the, the secret is in, the, is in the name, isn't it? We should be conserving. Conservatives should be conserving the best of uh, the institutions and uh, values of society. So that, for me, would be the family network. And by the family network, I don't just mean mom, pop and, you know, kids. I mean the extended family. I've... I've never known my own mum and dad happier than they are at the moment. And they are enjoying being grandparents. They love the fact that they uh, are bringing up my sister, helping to bring up my sister's um, son. Um, conserving uh, institutions like the independence of the press, the independence of the judiciary. Um, other, other, other things that we should be conserving, like family businesses, not... Uh, squashing family businesses with level of taxation and regulation that big businesses that are internationally footloose get away without paying and submitting to. So yes, conserving the best is absolutely central to um, conservatism. So if we can delete the answer I gave and just insert what you said now, Stephen, that probably would be best. <laughs> Let's talk about 21st century conservative thinkers and politicians. I mean, uh, as someone, a journalist who unfortunately has to look at these things very closely, uh, it, it's, it's a very easy thing to say that everyone's rubbish, you know, and everyone's mediocre. And, uh, but, w but when you look back in the past at these great titans of politicians throughout history, perhaps they're mythologized and at the time they were seen as, as rubbish as well. But it seems to me now that we, we really do have a mediocre bunch in power. Do you disagree with that? Yeah. No, no, I, I, and I don't know what the, 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 the key reason for it is. I think there are, are different possibilities, but I think the, I think you, me and the rest of the 24 seven media culture have our part to play. I think the most of our politicians are obsessed with how they are presented in the, in the media. And I think there's a short termism, you know, you look at the Western world at the moment, um, football managers get sacked, you know, if they have six matches of, poor results. Uh, most of our financial institutions are obsessed with their their quarterly results. Uh, politicians are worried about not just the latest set of opinion polls, but the latest opinion polls. We we operate in a an incredibly short term framework, and that puts us at a huge disadvantage, for example, against China and other countries which have a much longer uh, time frame. Having said all of that, I think there are some really impressive politicians out there. Um, my favourite politician at the moment may be, a, uh, may be a surprising one, and perhaps a lot of people watching this haven't heard of them, but I would say would be Mitch McConnell, the uh, leader of the Republicans in the Senate, not Donald Trump's favourite. But without that man's cunning, understanding of parliamentary uh, or senatorial uh, procedures, uh, without enormous grit, without the ability to marshal his uh, fellow senators, we wouldn't have just seen America's Supreme Court become a solid conservative majority. I think of all the conservative achievements over the last 10 or 20 years, I would put Brexit up there. And then I would put the, the changes in the US Supreme Court. And so conservative politicians, you know, they take on different forms. There are great communicators like Ronald Reagan. And there are great reformers and, and ideologues like Margaret Thatcher. But sometimes there are also just great uh, machinists like Mitch McConnell. We need to be good at working the system as well. So I'm not without hope, Stephen. I'm not without hope. There are some good people out there as well. It's funny you say Mitch McConnell because he's one of the probably one of the most boring and uninspiring speakers you could ever watch. <laughs> But yeah. as you say, he's had so much influence. 
He's got a lovely voice, though. Do you not think he's got a lovely voice? <laughs> well, they, they they take the piss out of him in America. They call him they call him Cocaine Mitch, don't they? Um, they do, yeah. But uh, <laughs> I don't know about his voice. I can't. I'm trying. I can't really remember what his voice sounds like. But no, well, I'm not going to even attempt to impersonate <laughs> it. But... <laughs> that was an invitation. <laughs> I also, in fact, I like the fact you go to his office. I don't know if this is still true. I went there a few years ago with Ian Duncan Smith on a trip to Washington, and his whole wall is covered with cartoons uh, that uh, uh, that ridicule him. Ah. So every time a cartoonist in America, and there have been plenty of times that this has happened, attacks Mitch McConnell, he he, he gets a copy and he puts it up on his wall, and um, he says it helps him keep him humble. And it just, he said, it inspires me to ultimately defeat these people. And um, I love him for that as well. Oh, that's fantastic. I think more politicians need a bit of that, that humbleness, don't they? Um, yeah. Let's talk about the Cold War and the 1970s, because I think this is perhaps um, one of my ideas of, of why um, we think conservative politicians in particular are so mediocre and why conservative politics seems so, uh, in some ways, um, uninspiring is because people have perhaps forgotten the alternative to a conservative free market system. And uh, those who remember the 1970s would, you know, they would argue that it was a complete and utter disaster. They would talk about the winter of uh, discontent um, and this, you know, all, all these strikes and, and the awful time they had then. And obviously there was the Cold War where you saw right in front of your eyes the alternative system to free market capitalism, uh, the hundreds of millions of people who died in China and Soviet Russia. So do we just lack an enemy? Do we lack a sort of alternative to say, look, we just, this is what it shouldn't be like. And, that, and therefore people have become complacent in a way. I actually think that may be the primary reason for the malaise uh, that we're seeing at the moment. It's not true in every country, but uh, if Man United, my football team, you may be able to notice a portrait, a painting of Old Trafford behind um, behind me. You know, if Man United played, um, I don't know, uh, my home city here of Salisbury every week, they wouldn't improve. You know, if um, but if Man United have to play Real Madrid or Liverpool or Chelsea every week, they get better. And we're seeing a period in um, in Western politics. Uh, it might be about to be shaken up with the coming result in the German elections. But generally, the left is weak at the moment. We're seeing this division between essentially social democratic parties on the left and the green ideas class, if you like. Now, these two, this, this tension between these two forces will eventually resolve itself. And I think that's a, a, a period when the left might enjoy some ascendancy. But at the moment, the left is largely divided. Now, that gives the Conservative Party a preponderance of, 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 of dominance in electoral politics. Most, most countries in the world are you know, seeing Conservatives beat left-wing parties most of the time. But rather than see that, as Mrs Thatcher would have done, uh, here's our opportunity while the opposition are weak uh, to change things, the class of politicians that you've just been referring to a few minutes ago see this just as their opportunity will to stay in power. It hasn't forced them to be better hasn't forced them to raise their game. And that's that's a great shame. But I would call it the Manchester United versus Salisbury effect. Do you think that basically these people have no, I mean, someone like Boris Johnson, I don't want to go too much into him personally, but uh, his him and you know his ilk, do they just lack conviction? Do they lack principles? I mean, someone wrote today, I, can't, I forget who, but um, Boris Johnson, if he saw Tony Blair do exactly how he is governing now, he would have been railing against it in the Daily Telegraph and other newspapers. So do these people simply lack any principles? I, I, perhaps Boris Johnson isn't the maybe the best example. I've always thought of Boris Johnson basically as a Eurosceptic Heseltine, you know, a, someone, a Michael Heseltine likes his sort of grand projets, big infrastructure projects, but unlike Heseltine, of course, backed Brexit through conviction or through um, opportunism, others will decide. Putting Boris Johnson aside, and I don't know the answer to this question. I could throw it back at you, Stephen. You watch these things as closely as me these days. But the people around Boris Johnson, Sajid Javid, Rishi Sunak, Dominic Raab, Liz Truss, Priti Patel, these are the children of Margaret Thatcher. They're almost as old as me. And you know they cut their political teeth um, when she was, you know, not just governing the country, but actually defining 
in a very personal way. This is what conservatism is. No one in the period when all of those people were growing up was in any doubt what conservatism was. And what I don't really understand is why they aren't getting together in a more concerted, fundamental way and just telling Boris Johnson, this is our government too. You're not president of this country. This is a parliamentary system. The cabinet is just you know, behaving like a rubber stamp at the moment. There's not the rebellion or the ideological tussle uh, that you would hope a serious Conservative Party would be engaging in. And I do not know the answer to the question as to why some of those people and others that I've just mentioned aren't as uh, annoyed about it as I think I, well, as I know I am, and as I, I think you are as well. Well, it's interesting. I was rec uh, recently reading Charles Moore's uh, fantastic biography of mm. Margaret Thatcher. And what, you know, her, what, what she faced in 1979 when she entered government was one of the most difficult situations any prime minister could face, not just on the face of it, you know, the, 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 catastrophic, the catastrophic events in the country that she had to deal with, but also to reform and revolutionise British politics in the way that she wanted to do. I mean, the opposition that she had was immense within her own party, within the civil service, uh, obviously, uh, huge opposition elsewhere as well. So, um, but but she managed to do it in in in, in huge ways. And I think one of the, one of the reasons that she she managed to do that was, as you say, she defined what her ideology was. She was a strong leader. People uh, wanted to work towards her, and also there was a sort of concerted effort across all levels of government to make these changes. And it seems to me that the current Conservative Party lacks the motivation because of perhaps a lack of leadership from Boris Johnson in defining what he wants. I mean, he talks about levelling up, for example, but again, no one knows what that means other than maybe help some people who are poor in the north. Um, and they lack the kind of the, 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 the means and the expertise to force the civil service, for example. And I, you, you would know better than I do because you were involved in advising Boris Johnson for a very brief time. But I think Bor very Dom very where Dominic <laughs> Cummings you know, gets it right, I think, from what I see, I speak to a lot of civil servants, is that ministers just don't know what they're doing and their advisors don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to manipulate government to instigate reform. And as I say, a big part of that may be Boris Johnson's leadership and his lack of a, a really firm ideology. What do you say to any of that? Do you agree? What do you think? Well, I, I won't say much because you made your points really well. One just anecdotal thing I would say, well, not anecdotal thing, but just the story of my um, observation of politics is that uh, someone recently who's joined the parliament, became an MP in 2017, the year when Theresa May lost uh, that election, well, failed to keep the majority, is very frustrated they're not already in the cabinet. And when I remember the 1980s, you know, people worked their way up very slowly. You know, they had to be a junior minister in two or three departments for quite a few years. They've been round the block before, you know, a few times before they got into the cabinet. There's now this expectation amongst parliamentarians that they get to high office incredibly quickly. And it's normally because they're good media performers or something that, 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 that they get there. And so, yeah, the people you describe who don't really know how to manage their departments, don't know what they want, don't know how to get civil servants to do what they want civil servants to do is because they haven't got enough experience. And um, I think we have a problem with our civil service. I think there's too much turnover. Uh, when Ian Duncan Smith um, you know, was trying to get universal credit through the system, you know, he used to have these meetings where the civil servant would say, yeah, we're going to get this issue sorted and it will be done in three months or six months. You know, the meeting would then come along in three and six months time. And that civil servant who promised to do that had now gone. You know, they'd been moved to another department and that was happening again and again and again. And so if you have that turnover, if you have that sort of just lack of general experience rather than specific experience, you just don't get the accountability for reform and change that any good system needs. And it's that lack of accountability that leads to the state I think we're in now. And I've seen so many examples uh, of civil servants making mistakes and huge errors. And instead of being sacked, they're either promoted or moved to another department. And to me, it's just like crazy, you know, for example, take the, the, the guy who left 
a load of MOD, top secret documents, at a bus stop in Kent, in his hometown. A guy called Angus Lapsley. He's one of the most senior civil servants in the MOD. He was recently exposed in the newspapers. They were going to promote him to NATO, to be Britain's representative to NATO, after that happened. Not, not even before. After, I mean, it's just like, to me, that's just total madness. And he's still within the Foreign Office. He's basically had no repercussions. I think they, they, they did an investigation. They removed his security clearance. But to me, like, that's just one example of where a civil servant yeah. can damage national security in a huge way and not even have, you know, no police investigation, nothing. Well, a similar sort of thing happens, you know, in, in parliamentary politics as well. You know, I have been part of, you know, I used to be a little bit more on the inside than I am now. But I remember discussions you know, about who should be promoted and who not. And some of the things that people said, well, trouble is, if we don't promote him, he'll kick up a real fuss and he'll be a real problem on the back benches. And then, you know, a really competent uh, junior minister. Yeah, well, they're not... They're doing a good job, but, you know, they'll be patient. They're not in a hurry. They won't cause trouble. And you have all these wrong criteria that, you know, mean that bad people are promoted and good people are kept in place or, or languish in some way. And so um, the only way you overcome that is if you, the leader of the political party is brave and across all the detail themselves. And one of the greatest problems in government at the moment, again, contrasting to Margaret Thatcher. And look, I've got some criticisms of Margaret Thatcher. I'm not pretending Margaret Thatcher was perfect, but ministers used to go into number 10 when she was prime minister and used to fear those meetings. They knew that they would have to know every dot and comma of their policy because she would and her advisers would. No one fears going into number 10 at the moment under Boris Johnson. It's all sloppy. It's, um, it's, uh, it's short, shortcut meetings. And, you know, the we don't have a parliament where scrutiny is really taking place. And so it's more important it takes place in the executive, but it's not happening. In 1997, Tony Blair won his landslide general election. And obviously the Conservatives were traumatised from that event. They went down to, I think, 160 MPs. Did this all start with that election in 1997? This kind of, the, the, everything we've been talking about in this interview, did that start because of that? And the Conservatives are so terrified of that being repeated. In part, I don't think you can isolate one particular period. You probably wouldn't if you really wanted to know, you know, because where did Blair get his modus operandi from? It really was probably Bill Clinton and that whole war room, every day is an election uh, kind of politics. You know, they, you, you, you fought every day for the news headlines, etc. And this I idea of the centre ground as well and sort of uh, amalgamating voters into one group and trying to please everyone. That seems to have started at least with, with Blair. Absolutely, yeah. The only thing that I think is particularly, I'm now desperately trying to give something better and more positive <laughs> in this. Uh, the only thing that I think that is fundamentally, so, so you're right, a lot of the, the ways that Blair operated, the search for eye-catching initiatives, the obsession with press management, yeah, and a lot of problems started then. But one thing that is better now than then is because Blair essentially invaded suburban England, the centre of political uh, conflict, if you like, was in better off, leafier, Worcester woman, etc. seats. The emergence of the whole red wall post-Brexit political geography at least means the battle now is over the votes of lower income people. So I think that's a better place for politics to be, fighting for people who need more help than it was during the Blair years. I think there's still a big hole. I don't think the Conservative Party has an, any agenda for the broken poor rather than the working poor. But fighting over the working poor is better than fighting over the middle classes. Well, an another perhaps optimistic thing to talk about for Conservatives in the UK is a recent, and I wouldn't say this, this is such an odd thing to say probably, but an opinion poll came out today where the Conservatives were behind Labour, for the, I think for the first time in a very long time, at least since the general election in 2019. Which I say hooray, by the way. Well, absolutely. and, and uh, I, I want the Conservative parties to start being frightened of the electorate again. Well, this is it. And I think there's a, you know, one of the problems, and we've talked about this briefly in this interview, one of the problems that we have 
is that there's not enough scrutiny of this government and there's not enough accountability. And obviously we can talk about how Labour and Keir Starmer are an ineffective opposition and Labour have basically been ineffective since 2010 as a proper opposition. Um, but there's also uh, perhaps a resurgence on the right. And you see in this poll, you know, it's only one poll, so you can't put too much uh, you know, importance on it. But the Reform Party were on 5%, even though the Reform Party is almost a complete non-entity. You know, no one's ever, I don't think anyone's really heard of Richard Tice, uh, its leader. And it, and it has very little presence, I would say, generally in, in the media or anywhere else. So, but they're still on 5%, you know, equivalent to the SNP. So could Boris Johnson start to face some worries? Because as he sees uh, the Conservatives struggling in the opinion polls after this tax hike, perhaps he could even face a revolt from, from the right. I'm, re I'm really interested. I hadn't noticed that, Steve, and you paid more attention to the uh, detail of the opinion poll than I have. Um, I wonder what I wonder whether people are, is it the name? Do they know what the Reform Party is? I wonder what the, whether it was a tick that they could, do they volunteer it? I'd be interested in how the question was constructed to know how real that support was. Um, I don't know. I like Richard Tice. I like, you know, some members of the Reform Party, but uh, he's not, they're not, Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage has his um, has his weaknesses and certainly has made some mistakes, but he's probably the most successful politician in Britain of the modern era. You know, like my hero, William Wilberforce. You know, he, he wasn't ever a party leader. <laughs> Wilberforce at least got into Parliament. Nigel Farage's impact has been amazing. And partly it's policy, but he's just a you know, it is the the general, the smoking, the drinking. It's the it's the populist touch. He's able to, he's optimistic and positive in a way that very few uh, sort of right wing populists tend to be. And I think unless the Reform Party or an equivalent can find someone like him, or perhaps drag him out of the GB News studios and get him back onto the front line of politics, I don't think that's going to happen. I think that it will be hard for a a populist party to take off. It's funny, I was speaking to Nigel yesterday for um, last week's podcast, and I, d I really doubt he's going to do that. But it, he was one of those people who, like Thatcher, when you were growing up, for me, when I was growing up, was um, you know, the most charismatic, to me, engaging conservative people out there. And he really got yeah. me interested in politics, you know, Brexit and everything else. Uh, I think there were a gen whole generation of, of young people who were watching him as he rose... Uh, so rapidly through the ranks of British politics and thinking, wow, there is something here that we can be engaged in, interested in uh, and yeah. hopeful for. And his story is, you know, I don't want to like, this is not an Nigel Farage loving, but his story is just so interesting, you know, fighting for this thing for 25 years and, vent and eventually winning against, again, against mm -hmm. all the odds. So um, absolutely fascinating. Let's well, talk um, just before we move on. Yeah. In, in American politics, this generally holds true in presidential elections is you know we are, we are those of us who are you and me um, well I'm going to include you as a political geek now you can sue me afterwards um Stephen but yeah we're obsessed with policy and positioning and all the rest of it but again and again in American politics the presidential candidate who is most likable who people would like to have a drink with would like to have round to dinner um is the politician that they vote for and that you know is why Boris Nigel Farage and so many other politicians keep confounding the left because the left think that politics is a university seminar and it isn't. And um, I think that's, of course, why Blair, you know, did so well. He's the first sort of likable Labour politician that Labour had for a while. And I think that, you know, back to our discussion about the definition of conservatism. Conservatism is fundamentally a people sized uh, philosophy. And so having someone who conveys that they get balance and perspective and what matters in life is you know in, in personifying it rather than just setting it out in policy that matters i'm glad you mentioned uh american politics uh, because this is a really interesting part of uh conservative thinking in britain as well and in recent years you've seen i think i think you and i have probably have different views on donald trump but in recent years, you've seen the rise of Donald Trump. And to many in America, he's really revitalized the conservative movement out there. He's uh, mobilized millions, maybe even tens of millions of people who were previously apathetic to politics. 
and mm. they feel that they've got someone who is representing them. And again, you know, we've seen the same tr trends in Britain where, and, and across the West, where globalisation has just left millions and millions of people stagnant and they felt that they'd been completely left behind. And when you had a politician like Donald Trump say, well, no, I actually represent you and I speak like you and I know what you think and I agree with your values and I'm not afraid to say it, um, then that really does invitalise and, and invigorate a lot of people. Do you think Britain has been immune to Trumpism so far? I take it you're a fan of Trump. Stephen. I wouldn't say, I, I, look, I, I, I am I'm nuanced. Uh, I wouldn't go as far to say as I'm, I'm not a mega fan, but I like what I like his anti elitism. I like his, mm. as I say, representing those people who feel that they've been left behind. I like the fact that he doesn't he's not a, he's not afraid of the media. I mean, he he wants to be liked. And that's one of his major faults. And he's obviously his tweeting and everything else. You can, we, as we all say, you know, you don't even have to say it now uh, was was wrong. And, and, and I don't like some of his communication style. But I think as a politician of the modern era, what he did in America, and he's a very funny guy as well, which I also like in a politician. I think what he did, uh, many things he did that were fantastic. I don't agree with everything, but, uh, and I don't know, I, th I suspect you'd be more critical of him than I would generally, but I don't know what, I don't really know what you uh, think about him. Well, look, well, let, let, let me answer your question about what is, whether we've had a much Trumpism in Britain in a minute, but I think it is important because Trump is the huge elephant in the room in modern conservatism in a way. and. Um, I do think he is a terrible role model. You know, I don't have kids, but if I did have children, I would not want them to regard him as someone you emulate. Yes, he's fun. You know, when he was doing his YMCA dance at his rallies and stuff, you know, you can't help but like him. It's back to that likability factor. Well, for me, um, I, I, I liked him. I felt sad. I, I haven't ever said this, I don't think, on the record, but on the night, it was clear he lost and he did lose. Um, I think he's really spoilt his legacy by denying that he lost the election. I, I felt sad, actually. I thought we had lost something. And why did I feel we'd lost something? Because even though he didn't really get to finding solutions to many of America's problems, he was able to say that uh, America got the wa overseas wars wrong. He, he actually knew that cutting the entitlements of pensioners which a lot of conservative Republicans want to do was was wrong. He knew that blue collar America was getting a raw deal from trade and immigration policies. He took on China, you know, for the first time any American leader had done that. And he also, you know, I the one time when I really knew that I was glad he was in the White House was when Democrats were completely trying to besmirch with no real evidence the reputation of Kavanaugh, the um, Supreme Court nominee. They were throwing absolute mud at this guy day in, day out, without any real foundation. And Donald Trump was throwing mud back. And, you know, he was fighting for conservatism like other people who would, you know, play by Queensbury rules would not. And... Part of the problem is, I think it was Megyn Kelly who said this, is that a lot of people like me wanted Donald Trump to go out there, fight the enemy, hand you know, and fist, and then come back at the meal table and then used to complain that they got their knife and fork in the wrong order. And he was, in a sense, that we did a deal with the devil in, in Donald Trump. I don't want him to be president again. I hope we can find a more sophisticated, thoughtful person who champions those same issues. But I, I do understand his importance. He did need to shake up what was a conservatism that was that was failing. Um, I thought we perhaps in Britain with some of Farage and some of Boris had that. We certainly did with some of Brexit. Um, we've got it a little bit with the reorientation of conservatism to lower paid workers. We're seeing it now in Canada's election. Erin O'Toole, who's putting up a really good fight against Justin Trudeau, he's standing for that too. Scott Morrison won the um, recent Australian election by winning in Queensland but losing in the posh sub Sydney suburbs. So there's a global thing happening. Um, but your question is are we seeing enough, or I can't remember exactly how you phrased it. Are we immune it? Are we Certainly not immune from it, no. Um, and I think conservative, I think GB News is quite a phenomenon, by the way. Um, 
I did this talking pints. Well, Nigel Farage is coming up a lot in that conversation. <laughs> but I did talking pints with him the other night. And, um, uh, you know, normally when I do an interview on Sky or BBC, you know, a few people text or message and um, say nice or not so complimentary things. I got 20, 30 messages immediately. My phone, you know, went back on after that interview. There is the conservative movement is watching GB News. And it will be interesting to see how GB News, which is quite Trumpy in many respects, certainly Farage, how that begins to potentially remould conservatism. I um, don't know whether I'm asking you or answering your question, Stephen, on this, but um, some random off the top of my head thoughts. No, I think, I think, you know, more generally, this analysis of Donald Trump and his impact on the conservative movement is really interesting. And you, and you gave a great answer on that. But let's, I want to ask two more questions. Uh, one of them is negative and one of them is positive. So again, forgive me for that. Uh, I mentioned earlier the rise of, of Jordan Peterson and, and the kind of academics, the, the charismatic, charismatic academics who are fighting this fight of against identity politics and these culture wars in recent years, which we've sort of skirted around a little bit in this interview. I want you to diagnose what you think the problem is in modern society, in our culture. And that's such a huge question, but I'll just narrow it down slightly. People, as I said earlier, many young people, many young men feel depressed. There's a huge rise in anxiety. Perhaps this is social media, perhaps it's something else. There's a huge rise in just this general sense of a lack of purpose and a lack of meaning in people's lives. And someone like Jordan Peterson, and he really was a phenomenal, I can't say that word, he really was an important figure, um, uh, and, he really, and he still is now. Millions of people yeah. read his book. They, they saw him as a sort of almost like a religious figure, giving them uh, solutions to their problems and explaining why they felt or feel the way that they feel. How do you think society in that sense, where are we going wrong? I mean, you know, we've talked about religion. Do you think that there is a huge rise in apathy, in depression, in anxiety? Can you just diagnose that issue? Yeah, this is, a, this is an easy question to uh, interview, isn't it, uh, Stephen? <laughs> you run here. <laughs> look, look, if people didn't think I was a religious nutcase after the answers I gave um, earlier, they may about to think that I am a religious nutcase, but um, here it goes. Um, I, I think we are all made in the image of God. And what does that mean? We're also, you know, Garden of Eden stuff. I'm not saying that, you know, the Genesis story was in you know, a few thousand years ago. Don't don't believe in all that. But the basic the basic story of what was told about us in Genesis is rings true for me, is true for me, is that made in the image of God, we are people capable of enormous creative power. You know, the human being is an amazingly inventive, technologically sophisticated, the languages you use, the products we've invented. That is the image of God in us. Um, but we're also fallen. We, we, took the, we took the apple from the serpent. We get loads of things wrong. And that's why I'm a conservative rather than a communist utopian. We need to be aware of our failings as well as our, as, as our strengths. But there is, there is in all of us, I think, a God-shaped hole. And that God-shaped hole from our creator is that we need a mission to be happy. We need to, we need to think we're here for a purpose. Uh, I think that's at the heart of every human soul. Now, some people will fill that with God. Some people will fill it with following Manchester United. Some people will fill it with a political purpose. Some with, you know, making their village greener or something. But I think there has been a general decline in understanding who we are as human beings, what makes us happy. Um, and I think, you know, as the Bible said, without a vision, people perish. And I think when the only thing we really have is an entertainment or consumerist culture, which I think is so dominant in our society now, I think people become unhappy. And um, I think part of the unhappiness epidemic that you've just described is because uh, we, aren't, we aren't being human with each other and we don't have that mission. Are you optimistic that people are beginning to wake up 
they're becoming woke in a, in that sense. They're become, they're beginning to wake up to this issue, and they've just that you know they're noticing how they are feeling, and that something's not right. And the fact that there's so many debates online now, and it really is a huge, huge uh, arena where people are talking about these issues in a way that I don't think I've I've certainly not seen in my you know very short lifetime. Uh, and perhaps I don't know if you have either, but uh, it seems to me that there's a huge, huge a uh, huge rise in people wanting to understand why they feel the way they do and how to solve it. So are you optimistic in that sense that we are finally having this discussion, even if it isn't necessarily about religion, but it is about purpose and it is about making things better? Um, uh, are you optimistic about that discussion? I, I wouldn't be too... I wouldn't be too... Um, black or white about that. Um, I person on a on a personal level, I think we've been through a really interesting period with the pandemic. Um, I live here in Salisbury, and during the pandemic, I wasn't going up to London much, uh, and I have formed much better relations with my neighbours and my friends and family in Salisbury than I ever had before. And I think people have learned that actually they don't need to commute five days a week that they can spend two or three of those days in their community. And that means, you know, they've got time to read the goodnight story to their kid, that they've got time to keep visiting that elderly neighbour who they delivered shopping for at the start of the pandemic. So without generalising about what I think you're talking about, about social media and some of the other revolutions that are taking place, I do see something quite good that could possibly come out of the pandemic and the way we have Salisbury, for example, is doing really well, it seems to me, commercially, because lots of people are spending more here than they used to spend their money in, in the capital city, etc. And I think actually living more and living and working more in the same place, that could be really good because I think we are better humans with each other when we know each other not just when we don't just operate in the same realm work realm or social realm but in a in a whole variety we see the same people we work with at the cinema at the restaurant and walking the dog in the park you just notice people more you get to know people more you spot when people may be unhappy or they haven't appeared for a while and so if there is a restoration Stephen of community life um, I think then I would be optimistic, but I would see it more coming out of that than from some great, you know, as good as Jordan Peterson is, you know, from some great new book or philosophy that's been that will be popularised for a, for a season. I feel like you're a sort of walking advert for Salisbury. I I, I hear so much about it from your Twitter, which is fantastic. I must go and visit one day. Um, I, I hear... don't get paid for it either. <laughs> well, I hear from the Russians the cathedral is very very beautiful and everything. But um. Oh, dear. <laughs> anyway, look, Tim. Thank you so much for joining us. That was brilliant.